Great. All right. So good morning, good afternoon, uh, good day to everyone. Um, we are at the PodRex workshop on podcast recommendations at Rexis 2021. It's very good to see you all here. I want to do a quick introduction of um, my co-organizers. Uh, I'm Ching-Wei Chen um, from Spotify, and we have uh, with us today Rosie Jones and Zara Nazari, also from Spotify. Uh, Long Chi Yang will be joining us a little later. He's on the, the West Coast, uh, but he's from Microsoft. Uh, Maria Eskovich from Clarin Eric, uh, Gareth Jones from Dublin City University, and Sergio Oramas from Pandora Sirius XM. Uh, I also wanted to give a <clears throat> big thank you to our program committee um, from all over for helping us review the submissions uh, for the workshop. And I'm very pleased to announce the accepted papers for this year. Uh, we have three papers that they will be presenting uh, later today. Um, and you'll, you'll hear more about them later, but congratulations to the accepted papers. A uh, quick, um, in addition to the accepted papers, we'll also be hearing from Rosie. Uh, she'll be giving our keynote today on the topic of listening to our listeners, podcast content understanding for search and recommendations. Uh, we will also be featuring a podcast creator panel. Uh, we have this panel moderated by Ni No from Spotify. And um, we're very lucky to have um, <clears throat> panelists uh, who are prominent podcasters and producers of podcasts joining us to discuss their hopes, their dreams, and their fears about, um, about podcast recommendations. So we have today... Wendy Zuckerman, who is a radio journalist and the creator and host of Science Versus. We have Patrick Cox, who is an editor, reporter, and the creator of the subtitle podcast. We have Ali Bandari, who is the creator and host of Channel B and um, B Plus podcast. And also Josh Richmond, uh, who is a producer of the Stitcher series of Earwolf podcasts. So that should be pretty exciting. A uh, quick glance of the program for today. <clears throat> we'll start with the keynote. Uh, and then after the keynote, we have an uh, interactive workshop activity. If anyone joined last year, we had a lot of fun in, in our breakout rooms, thinking about ways to kind of bootstrap a podcast recommender system. This year, uh, Gareth will be leading uh, um, these breakout rooms again with uh, some tasks that um, are coming off of the keynote. We also then will go into, after a break, we'll go into the, the papers, uh, the paper presentations and have another break. Uh, and then we will uh, have the podcast creator panel and then wrap up and finish. So we're gonna start right now with the keynote. I'll hand it over to Rosie. Rosie is our director of language of the language technologies lab at Spotify. Um, and I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about uh, listening to our listeners, to our podcast listeners, podcast content understanding for search and recommendation. And I'm going to talk about some open challenges. It's quite common when we give a talk that we talk about the things we've done and really focus on the accomplishments and, and how much we know. Today, I'm also gonna bring up some issues of things we don't know yet to help us think through in this workshop, how we, how we might develop uh, our research on podcast recommendation and further. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here in Amsterdam with you all. Um, it's so exciting to, to come to Amsterdam, ride a bicycle, uh, see some people, and uh, you know, it's great to get out. Uh, but the truth is, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm still at home in Boston, uh, in my bedroom. Uh, Boston is a place that if you've been to the USA, you might know. Um, it's quite famous for the baseball. Um, its historic buildings are not quite as historic as those in Amsterdam. And the, uh, I, I'm quite fond of the ocean in Boston. Rosie, um, we, uh, we don't see your, your presentation. Oh, boy. After all that. <laughs> did I share my screen? I didn't hit share. 
I didn't hit share. I thought I'd be brave and not say, can you see my screen? <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. There's our baseball field. Here's our buildings not as historic as those in Amsterdam. Here's the ocean at situate Massachusetts. It's really nice. Uh, so when I'm dreaming of going to Amsterdam, uh, one of the ways I can kind of get a little bit closer is by listening to podcasts about it, Amsterdam and the Netherlands. Um, so when I look for some podcasts about Amsterdam, these are some things that come up. And there's a lot of interesting things here. Um, there's language learning podcasts. There uh, is history of the Netherlands. Um, there's travel to Amsterdam, which seems like it could be really interesting. And so then, you know, I've got to kind of pick out one of these that I might want to listen to. Um, there's lots of different reasons that people listen to podcasts. Um, really top uh, one of the motivations people have is to learn things and explore more um, for their hobbies and interests and to learn practical knowledge. Um, and so, so there's a really wide range of reasons to, to listen to things. So people do things like follow the host, I guess, or even for emotional companionship. As far as um, how popular podcasts are, they're really uh, growing in popularity. Um, internationally being listened to by lots and lots of people. These, these numbers are now a little bit out of date, the 2019, but we're just seeing the, grow the interest in podcasts is growing more and more. And one of the reasons that uh, podcasts are popular is because you can you do listen to them while multitasking. And so this survey showed that a lot of people listen to podcasts while riding pu public transportation, while doing housework, while doing other things. And if you look at how often people are listening to a podcast well sorry and just this this um this data was from china so people are riding public transportation are probably taking trains um if in the us people are listening to podcasts while driving um and i suspect if we're in amsterdam we might see people listening to podcasts while riding their bicycles but uh, as far as uh, when people listen to podcasts really they're often doing something um and in fact as far as um not only 3% of the time are people listening to podcasts while well, they're not doing anything else. And quite a large fraction of the time people listen to podcasts is to relax before going to sleep. Um, and I certainly find that that is a motivation for me. Um, on the other hand, I can't always listen to the podcast all the way through if it's a, if it's a very relaxing one. And uh, so, so we have a few data sets around for studying podcasts. Um, this one I'm indicating here is from Spotify, we released a data set of about 100,000 podcasts last year for research on search and summarization. And I'll talk a little bit about this and how we think about podcast recommendation. Um, so this data set uh, uh, um, has uh, about 100,000 podcasts. Each podcast has metadata, um, such as the name, the description, the publisher, as a raw audio file. Um, and it also has a machine generated transcript. So a transcript of what was said generated by automatic speech recognition. Um, and this adds up to about 60,000 hours of audio with two terabytes of data and 600 million words of transcript. So it's a really large data set. On the other hand, and normally I'd be saying, what a great data set this is. It's a really great opportunity to be doing research um, on NLP problems on podcasts. All your favorite NLP problems are applicable here on uh, speech speech document retrieval, spoken document retrieval problems. But on the other hand, this doesn't have any user ratings or behavior data. So when we come to Rexis and want to talk about recommendation, um, this data set doesn't give you everything you need to start some experiments for recommendation. Um, there's lots of different kinds of podcasts in there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, lots of the styles that we see in podcasts. Um, but just to sort of briefly digress to another data set, um, Long Chi Yang and colleagues made a data set, another data set that consists of 88,000 episodes. Um, that does have some ratings. It has uh, binary popularity labels for 6,500 episodes. So it's a modest annotated set size. Um, it has transcripts of the first 10 minutes of audio. And then um, some of the annotations they asked were things like how calm or energetic is this? They are asked for Amazon Mechanical Turkers, how humorous or serious is the audio presentation? Um, and then also they got, um, as I mentioned, the binary popularity labels. And so 
um, Yang et al. were able to carry out some experiments in this. On the other hand, it was binary task, popular or less popular, which um, doesn't give us detailed user behavior, listening behavior to help us build models to predict how we would recommend podcasts to an individual user. So things we might want from a podcast recommendation, recommendation data set, um, we could consider existing recommendation sets like the Netflix prize data set, the movie lens data. Um, these tend to have user judgments on many items. Um, ideally, we'd have user interactions. And also Francesco Beghetto later today is going to talk about some other things that he sees um, uh, as things that we would want to think about when designing a podcast recommendation data set. So one open research problem in podcast recommendation is explanation. So why did I get that list of podcasts recommended to me? Um, so this one here is a, a sleep podcast. That might be a good one for me um, if I'd like to listen to podcasts while going to sleep. It's about rain in Amsterdam. So I might not learn so much about um, the topic of Amsterdam, but on the other hand, I might have a relaxing experience. And another one that's recommended to me here is uh, Idiots and Abroad. Um, and if we look closer at this one, it's 128 minutes long. So that's a big, big time investment. Um, if I'm gonna be listening to this one, not for going to sleep, but for some more um, contentful or, or learning exercise. So it'd be really nice to know more about what's in this podcast, what it's about, when, I wanna, when I'm going to decide to make a commitment like that. And so we might ask, is that uncharacteristic that this podcast is so long? And um, we can kind of take a look at the distribution of podcast links and see what kind of time commitment it is for people. Uh, and uh, in fact, this is a distribution of lengths of podcasts. So this is the duration in minutes. Um, and this is the number of podcasts of that length in this data set of 100,000 podcasts. And we find on the one hand, there are a lot of two minute long podcasts that turns out to be podcasts that are specialized in length for listening to while you're brushing your teeth. And I admit it could be nice to have some little two minute vignettes about Amsterdam while brushing my teeth before the conference this, this morning. Um, there are other ones that, um, and quite common is this bump around 30 minutes. And there we see sort of the really um, professionally produced podcasts where the creator has recorded perhaps a longer piece of audio and then edited down just to the most interesting pieces. Um, and so that's actually kind of interesting place in length of podcasts. But then we see longer, very chatty podcasts and even way out on the tail here, we've got very, very long podcasts like my dog's favorite podcast, something you play to keep your dog company while you're say out at work and uh, give them some comforting noises. Um, and then uh, this one we were just talking about Joms and Amsterdam is out here in the two hour and eight minute length. So um, it's gonna be a really big commitment to listen to a podcast like that. So it'd be nice to have, if the, um, be having this podcast recommended to me, a re explanation to give me some information about what's in this podcast that might appeal to me um, what, from a topical point of view or other things that might be relevant to me when I'm considering whether to listen to this one. Um, so if we look a little bit closer at this, it comes with a description. So we know the duration, it comes with a description and the description is, uh, welcome to episode two of Idiots and Abroad. John left Korea and made it to Amsterdam. Alana left Australia. Jacob visited Vegas and Rahul is still in Los Angeles. Compelling. So they say it's compelling. Um, I'd like to know if it'd be compelling for me and, and how much of it is really about Amsterdam or is that really just a very passing topic would also be a kind of thing I'd want to know when I'm making this decision about whether to listen to this podcast. And actually, if we look more generally at what people say is important to them when they're considering listening to a new podcast show, they mention the podcast description a lot. That's the most common thing that's recommended. Um, then they mention the titles of episodes in that podcast show, the frequency that the episodes come out, the ratings and reviews, and the artwork. And these are sort of the things you see at the top when you um, have a podcast. And those are things, uh, some of those things are things that are produced by the podcast creator themselves. For example, the creator makes their own description that invites the user in to listen. <clears throat> On the other hand, as designers of algorithms and recommendation systems, we might think about what could we provide other than things that the creator provided to help them decide whether this is something they'd like to listen to. And I wanna drill in a little bit more into the podcast description since that comes from the creator themselves. How good are those for users deciding whether to listen? Well, we did a little study of that um, and we found that if we ask um, a sample of annotators, how good is this description provided by the creator to help you decide whether or not you want to listen to this podcast? And uh, about 
half the time the answer was fair or bad. So these creator descriptions are not necessarily the ideal thing you would want to look at to um, help you decide whether or not to listen to the podcast. On the other hand, some of them are excellent good. So we could, could we use that um, to learn how to make good descriptions for our, as explanations for our podcast listeners? And some of them are really, really bad. Just to give you an example of these ones. This is a description that comes from an American football podcast. I think we could approximately say the description is Josh Gordon, which could be a really compelling description if you know who Josh Gordon is. You care who he is, perhaps you're excited that he's back. But if you're new to this podcast, then it really doesn't tell you very much at all. And so that's sort of the kinds of things we're seeing in these fair and bad descriptions uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, their value in making a decision about podcast listening. So we decided to look at this into this problem a little bit more deeply by trying some summarization. And so the idea with summarization is we want to um, think of the, so the, the description is something the creator has written to sort of, it's their impression of what people might want to know about the podcast. But on the other hand, what really happened is what is spoken that we can either get from the transcript. And so here is just a brief uh, depiction of the speech transcript, which we could also um, denote here, or even the raw audio itself and generate some kind of summary from that. And then again, the task to decide whether we're successful is this, is could you decide whether to listen based on this summary? And so based on, this is just the first part of a very, very long, you know, I think this is a 60 minute podcast. Um, we're able to summarize that, and I'll talk a little bit more how, into this week, Bill and I talk about our weekend drinking habits, what we've been up to and why, my, why Meg Ryan is a rom-com goddess. And so it gives you a little flavor of this podcast, both topically and sort of stylistically, you can see it's a little bit of a informal podcast based on the language here. And so there's a couple of approaches we can take to summarization. Um, extractive summarization is where we take uh, the phrases or sentences within the podcast that contain the most salient content. And that tends to be things like uh, words that are occurring frequently or words that are co-occurring with other ones that are occurring frequently. Um, and then identify that based on a, a graph algorithm, those ones that really seem to be most central to the overall topic and then select the sentences containing those. Um, then more recently, abstractive summarization is really getting a big boost from recent advances in deep learning and transformers. Uh, and we're now able to generate new summary content based on neural generative summarization. And so these could be a big help to our listeners to give them a gist of what the podcast is about, even in those cases where the creator has not been as uh, informative as we might like. And so we can see some sample podcasts. This is the text rank example. Um, and we just looked at this example from Bart Podcast. Um, they can even generate uh, some of the boilerplate for you. And I'm not gonna talk about it in detail, but. Um, identifying that boilerplate is sort of another interesting sub problem. So overall, we find that uh, those abstractor summaries perform better than extractor summaries um, when um, evaluated on this human judgments of would this be help you decide whether or not to listen to this podcast. Um, they're performing around about the level of their creator this, uh, and had fewer bad summaries, fewer of those real Josh Gordon shouty shouty. Um, summaries. And so this is, I would um, like to bring up first as one area of research where we're already at, almost at human level. How could we identify the bad creator podcasts and identify, uh, replace those with automatically generated ones, or even make personalized summaries for our users to help them decide when, whether to listen to a particular recommendation. So just to sort of uh, dwell on that just for a minute more, we, we've got an open research problem of explanation. We know there's a high user investment in podcasts. Um, people listen to 30 minutes or more per episode. So that's a really big investment. And users would like to understand what they're being recommended. So we could think about summarization, audio trailers, or other kinds of explanations. Um, let's just sort of think a bit more about what else matters to our listeners. Um, we This is from a study by... Sarkias, Larson, and Dereika from which they published in JSYST in 2010. Um, and it's really one of uh, the first really um, significant publications in the podcast research area that we can find. Um, and they looked at a number of different indicators of podcast quality. And so they um, devised a frame of attributes and manually annotated a small set of podcasts and then used that to predict iTunes engagement. So for example, the um, 
whether or not it contained opinions, you, what, who the guests were and so on, those things were manually annotated. Um, but in that context, they found that um, the topic of the podcast was um, important in 68% of preferred podcasts. So that's an important area that we've just been talking about in summarization, maybe one way to get at that. But then there are other also very important factors. So for example, qualities of the podcast themselves, their fluency, their, whether they hesitate, the speech, speed of their speech was also uh, very relevant. And then also things on the technical execution side. So is there an opening jingle? What are the sound effects? And so something we haven't talked at all so far is properties of speech and audio. They're really important in podcasts because it's, a, it's an audio format. And if we just look at it in terms of either the text metadata provided by the creator or um, transcripts that we might generate on the audio, we're really losing a lot of the richness that's in there that does matter to people when they're making decisions about listening or to continue listening or to come back to a podcast. And that if we, we had judgments, those things also presumably would affect their ratings of those podcasts. So I just want to dwell a bit more on this category of the podcaster, um, how, how they create their podcast. We, we did a, a, a study to go into a little bit more depth into that. Um, and one thing we know is that podcast creators are really trying to optimize this kind of thing. And they read, they receive lots of common sense speaking advice to help them connect with their listeners. Um, but we have a question about whether that advice is validated by the data. And some of the advice you'll kind of see is keep it succinct. Um, when choosing your podcast name, shorter, shorter is sweeter. Um, your show needs, podcast is show notes, how to speak slowly on your podcast. You know, here's a question, should you swear in your podcast? Um, maybe people don't want to listen to swear words. On the other hand, maybe that makes it sound really authentic. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, so these are some things that podcast does take into consideration and get advice on. Um, and then if, as well as um, being a source of information for the podcast creator themselves, it's also interesting to think about when we're doing content-based recommendations. So we have a new episode of a new podcast show. Would that have broad appeal? And are there some of these stylistic things that could be important in making a recommendation? So we looked into this um, data in this 100,000 English podcast data set that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we looked um, at the automatically generated transcripts and the titles and descriptions. Here I'm focusing on the text and the transcripts, and then we'll come to the audio uh, a little later. Um, and we looked at the episode engagement metrics. So what are, what, um, how, what's the rate of listen, for first time listeners of the podcast, how many of them listen for at least five minutes? And the idea is that first time listeners are gonna be perhaps a little less patient um, with things that might be jarring in a podcast. And so they'll really have a sort of a first gut reaction, but that predicts whether there'll be long-term listeners to that podcast as well. Um, and we pre-process the podcast. We, I mentioned earlier, we can identify some of the boilerplate um, or ads in the descriptions. Um, and then we trained a, um, LDA to get hundred topics over the podcast data set. And we ran some part of speech tagging and also identified emotion words using a lexicon. As, and then also looked at some low level audio features. And so some of the stylistic features we looked at are things that are um, uh, mentioned in advice to podcast creators, such as the length uh, of the podcast, the relevance of the description, um, emotion words that are being used, fillers and disfluencies, that's things like ums and ahs, swearing and vocabulary diversity, uh, ads, speech rate and parts of speech. And so just to sort of summarize what the advice says, and then we'll kind of test whether we think those things really do bear out. Um, the, the length here is in terms of the length. The description should be succinct, succinct, but kept informative. Swearing should be either avoided or a small amount of it kept for character. The description relevance should be relevant to the podcast. The emotions expressed in the podcast should be upbeat and positive. So that's pretty prescriptive. Um, you could imagine having a podcast where you, um, have less positive things to say about you know, events of the day or uh, so on. So, you know, it's sort of interesting to see how often this is true. Filters and disfluencies, those are the ums and ahs. Uh, vocabulary diversity, um, distinctiveness, and then speech rate is recommended to speak slowly. Um, and so we uh, divided our data into four quartiles, um, partly because the most popular port um, podcasts do have the, the greatest listening rate, but this way we can um, look for the, for the lowest quarter of popularity, what distinguishes there for the next quarter and so on. 
Um, and in fact, most of that advice to podcast creators is validated. So compared to lower engagement episodes, high engagement ones do have long and relevant descriptions. They do have fewer ads in their transcripts. They do have more show, show notes and ads and less swearing. They've got higher vocabulary diversity and reading grade levels. And they do have more positive emotions and few negative emotions. But there are some new insights that are contrary to what is the typical recommendation to podcast creators. So uh, high engagement ones have lower distinctiveness. That means their vocabulary um, as distinguished by cross entropy is um, relatively uh, more ordinary choice of words. Their speech is faster. Um, they have fewer filler words, but only in the lowest popularity quartile. And they have more adverbs and conjunctions and fewer nouns and pronouns. And so, um, you know, what does that mean? Fewer nouns and pronouns means less of I and you and he and she and more of um, frequently and, and, and so on. So it's something about the way they're speaking. And it may be that it's more technical and less personal in this case. Actually, I haven't got the data here, but in general, the speech in podcasts is very, very personal. This is a lot more pronouns, first person pronouns like I and we compared to say written language or other kind of language. So then if we use that textual content to try and predict engagement, um, our baseline is 50% because we did a 50-50 split on the data. Using the stylistic features, we can get 71% accuracy. Um, using TF-IDF, we can get a 76% accuracy. And then BERT, over all of these features, we can get up to 80% accuracy at predicting the level of engagement. So it shows that there's really a lot of relevant information in the textual content that predicts engagement. And I want to um, step back for a minute. I, I haven't got a separate slide about this, just to say often when we think about recommending, we think about collaborator filtering as um, one of our sort of first tools we use um, because it's a really powerful one. But on the other hand, um, if we've got a podcast that doesn't have any listening history, and I'll bring this up again later, looking at the textual context can be um, a really val valuable piece of information. And so I think some, combining those things is something that would be good for us to look in in further work. Um, so to the takeaways from this section here is that most podcast creation advice is validated by the data um, and linguistic content can distinguish between high and low stream rate podcasts. So what else matters to listeners? We've talked about um, the topical content, we've talked a little bit about the podcaster and how they speak. Um, and then the other category I'd really like to, sp to spend a little while on is um, what uh, Sakias so Larson and Duraga called technical execution, but here I want to focus on it as audio because it's aspects about um, the sound of um, it's like deliberately inserted sounds like opening jingles, um, inadvertent sounds like background noise, editing effects, and so on. And those things also have an impact on listener uh, happiness with the podcasts. So let's just talk a little bit about this problem of using podcast audio. Um, one thing we know from some research that Young and colleagues did and published in Wisdom 2019 is that popular podcasts have higher audio energy. So they um, built a data set um, that we alluded to a little bit earlier that had um, podcast episodes distinguished by high and low popularity and then computed some features on that raw audio signal and were able to um, uh, distinguish, especially using energy. Um, although the seriousness did not seem to have as much of an impact on the um, predictive power for predicting popularity. So combining um, the audio features with text could be a really valuable thing in the podcast recommendation. But I think this is a, still an open area. There's a lot of work still to be done in audio. Um, a little bit more has been done um, in the context of the Trek podcast track, which has been running for the last two years. Um, there, uh, we made available podcast data set and then to find a task over that, a search task, which we describe as segment retrieval, find the most relevant two minute set long podcast in a, from a large set of podcast segments. Sorry, not two minute long podcast, two minute long segment of a podcast. And then also summarization. And this is the problem we were talking about earlier. Um, and one way to think about um, how audio could impact this, we could we've talked about the summarization task as a text summarization problem and returning a text snippet that captures the most important content. But another um, piece that we've added to this evaluation this year is asking the participants to identify an audio file of up to one minute duration to give the user a sense of what the podcast sounds like. Um, and we don't yet have that data evaluated yet, but this is something that could be, again, really very 
valuable to um, understand what's important to the listener and as a form of explanation, an audio summary can be a form of explanation to users to give them a preview of a podcast before they decide to commit that large amount of time to listening. Um, so now I'm going to talk very briefly over a couple of other um, areas that I think are open problems. Um, so search um, is really important to recommendation. And I just want to, um, well, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I've gone back to my, um, my uh, Amsterdam example here. Uh, so in this case, I searched for Amsterdam. Um, I got a variety of results of lots of different kinds, language learning ones. This one here, um, New York City history, this is because Amsterdam matches life in New Amsterdam, which is an old fashioned name for New York. So you can see there's all sorts of things going on in the search results. And without like a clear explanation of why these things are coming up or um, uh, without uh, some way of tailoring these more to me, it can be really challenging to choose the things I want to listen to. Um, here's an example from Netflix, which I think is kind of interesting because I should have picked out an Amsterdam example. But here, when you go on Netflix and search for a movie, in this case that they don't have, they show you uh, titles related to that movie. So here is lots of different, the movie I was looking for is Wally. -E, they don't have it, but they show me lots of different other um, movies that I could watch instead of that. And so I just want to kind of emphasize that search and recommended are really very related. Often we think of them as sort of separate tasks, but when in a search context, we might want to return recommendations. Um, and in a recommendation task, we might want to think about how a user's past search pertains to that. Um, so just to sort of come back to the, the Trek task that we set up, um, one of the topics, one of the tasks was a search task, um, retrieving these two minute segments for a search query. Um, and uh, based in part on looking at some of these other things that we think are important as to listeners, we've added some uh, new ranking criteria this year. So we not only are looking for whether the episodes are relevant to the topic description, but also things like, are they entertaining? Um, are they subjective? And is it a discussion? And so these are sort of things that sort of take into account some of these other things that we know could be, uh, are interesting to the user. And we need to sort of start thinking about what kind of data do we have to do with that? And how do we um, generate algorithms that can kind of um, approach the problem in this way? Um, and so then the last, or I think last or penultimate <laughs> research problem I'd like to bring up is recommending the tail. Um, so one of the things we know, um, it, it comes up again and again, is that word of mouth drives podcast listening. And one of the reasons for that is that um, new podcasts come out, um, they don't necessarily have a lot of listening history and people aren't able to find them in uh, podcast recommenders that are primarily focus on collaborative filtering. Um, and it's the, the classic problem we have of cold start and warm start, and it, it's no different for podcasts. We have seen some research um, applying recommend a recommendation to cold start podcast users who have some other interaction with the app. So for example, Narazi and colleagues published in CDIR 2020, um, some work about using music listening history um, as a way to represent some of uh, the things that, about a user that might predict their podcast listening history. Um, and Yang and colleagues published in 2019 some interesting work about the onboarding. So when you sign up for a podcast app, it can kind of ask you what categories you're interested in and those aspirational listening goals um, can drive better recommendation and also help explaining the recommendations you receive. So that's kind of interesting both in a kind of warm start uh, or let's say cold start setting and then also in a explanation setting. Now, when we have, that's for the whole show, when we have cold start episodes, we might want to piggyback on the show information. So this is a popular show or the show is about this, but it, still, it falls down a little bit when the episode, um, you know, maybe the podcast differs in topic from episode to episode, or it might just be a really not very good episode from this show. And so if we can have some other way of knowing something about what's going on there, that could be about um, valuable. And then Cold Start shows this is really an open challenge. There, the question of fairness to creators comes up. Um, and actually in our panel a little bit later, I think some of our, um, podcast creator panelists are going to talk a little bit about that, about how when they make their show, they'd really like to make sure it's heard by the audience who would be interested in that. Um, and if it's always the most famous podcasts that are getting all the listeners, then um, both the creators are not getting the audience that they uh, might like to reach. And also the listeners might not be finding the best podcast for their interests. 
So I think that um, thinking about how we can recommend um, tail podcasts or cold start podcasts is a really interesting and important challenge. Um, and then, then finally, very briefly, just to talk a little bit about success metrics for podcast recommendation. Um, one thing we know is that um, the various podcast um, uh, listening apps provide data for the podcast creators. So for example, if you're a creator, you can go into Spotify podcasts and see um, your start and stream data, your listener and follow data, there's podcast charts available. And so the creators can use that to sort of see in, on, um, within themselves, this episode is more popular than that other episode and think about how they might make some improvements um, if they can come up with changes that might want to wait. But what we don't know is how those things relate to user satisfaction. And uh, I, I, I'm hard pressed to think of any studies that have gone in any great detail about user satisfaction, except by taking the podcast charts, saying, okay, a popular thing um, is, is perhaps a higher satisfaction podcast and a, a lower popular podcast is, has, relates to lower user satisfaction. But obviously we know that people have very diverse interests and popular may just be pertained to more people's interests rather than being sort of quality for individual users. Um, so just to sort of wrap up, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, my colleagues at Spotify, also Gareth Jones and Maria Eskovich, um, Sravan Reddy, who have co collaborated on a lot of this work and have also included work by other people not at Spotify. Um, and to kind of sum up um, some of these open research directions that I think would be great for us to discuss in the workshop today and also think about um, how we could integrate into our research into the future, um, include evaluating podcast recommendations, um, the explanations and how we can help the user understand why they got a particular recommendation. Using audio in recommendation, I think is a really under tapped area. Um, recommending the tail, both from the point of view of fairness um, and from the point of view of cold start problem, and then search and recommendation for podcasts and thinking about how, how those things interrelate. I think are other really important areas for us to consider. So now I'd like to turn it over to Gareth, I think, who's going to um, bring us into our activity.